Now let's stand on our feet and get ready to praise the Lord. Good morning, Maranatha. Oh, it's good to see you this wonderful Sunday morning. Why don't y'all go ahead and put your hands together and sing this out with us. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name
worship team has been here since 7.30 this morning. We've been in prayer two times. We have worshiped twice together already. This is our third time. And let me tell you right now, I feel it in my spirit. The Lord is here. When the verse says, Jesus, you change everything. God, thank you, God, for changing everything in my life. Thank you, God, for being in this place this morning, right here and right now. The song says, chains are falling. Jesus, you change everything. here that miracles happen. It's here that lives are changed. Oh, yes, he's calling. 
promise was that if we gathered in your name you'll be in the midst of us and we know that you are we feel your presence Lord if anything you need to do in this service today Lord I want you to do it I want you to touch hearts and change lives I want you to just do whatever it is that will draw us ever closer to you Lord we're grateful we're grateful for good worship that has led us into your presence And now, Lord, do your thing in us. Just work in us to change us, to be like you. Lord, we thank you for all that you have done and all that you're going to do. And with that, we give you praise and honor and glory for you are worthy this morning. You are worthy, and we love you. Amen. Give him a hand of praise, would you? Hallelujah. You may be seated this morning. Before our ushers come to receive, I want to tell you uh, about a a little thing that went on this week. I've been in uh, uh, California this past week, and I was with about um, 
uh, probably a couple of hundred people, maybe 75 pastors and businessmen, where we gathered to raise funds for Fire Bible. I don't know if you know what Fire Bible is all about, so let me just give you a brief explanation. It's a regular Bible as far as the words of God, but it has in it 77 articles of faith, and it also has notes of explanation. Now, what happens is a lot of times in foreign countries, they're unable to either get a Bible education or able to really study. You might take a shade tree pastor in Africa who might gather 800 to 1,000 people on a, on a, a given day. He is limited in his education, but if we can put in his hands a Bible written in his own heart language and the notes, the study notes that go with it, it transforms his life. I keep three or four of these in my office all the time for people who say, Pastor, can I buy one? They want one. They, uh, they're wonderful Bibles. But this is a different process. It takes between 800000 and a $1 million to translate into the heart language of these nations and countries around the world. It's not the printing of these Bibles that cost us so much. It is the translation and the notes that have to be translated. And so we gathered together to raise money. And uh, we listened to some speakers challenge our hearts. We talked with each other and uh, other different pastors and businessmen around the world, around the United States especially. And uh, we raised at the Monday night opening banquet $1.7 million. That's uh, one of the biggest offerings uh, that we've been able to uh, uh, be a part of. You say, Pastor, why do you tell us this? I think this and Global University, along with our missionaries, are probably three of the most um, advantageous things to the church. And uh, if you want to be a part of that, all you've got to do is write on your check, Fire Bible or missions or whatever, and we we give to this. We are a, a great part of it, and I appreciate your help in doing so. You know, God opened some wonderful doors for us to give, and he says it'll be given back to us, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It's a great thing when the Lord says, if you give it, I'll just show you what I'll do. I'll give it back to you. I was uh, met with a, a man from Singapore, and he pastors a church over in Singapore, and I talked to him. I said, Dom, do you, uh, what's your capital gains? What, what do you do for missions? He said, uh, well, we raise a, a little bit. He said, not as much as I'd like. I said, well, what is your offering for missions? He said, between 15 and 20 million. I said, oh, my God. <laughs> Hard for me to think in terms of that. Yeah, gave me a new vision. He said, we teach our church sacrificial giving. And he said, God has blessed us as a very large church with a, uh, a great church of starting other churches out of it. And uh, I'm thinking, Lord, if they can do that, surely we can, we can get to a million at some point. But I love missions. It's terrible for you to have a pastor that just loves missions as much as I do <laughs> because I, uh, I want you to catch that same fire and vision. And... Uh, I just appreciate a, a great church, and we have a great church here. i got to tell you, we do. Our ushers are going to come at this time and give you the opportunity to give. It takes a, quite a sum of money to uh, continue all the ministries that we have here. keeps the air conditioned, lights going, the staff, ministries that we have provided for our church. And so we appreciate the fact that you give. During covid um, people were, were really responsive. Bet they would drive by and leave their tithe here at the church, and they made sure it came in. But I have to say, for all churches after COVID, it kind of began to dwindle. I don't know why, but we uh, can use your help. I don't ask for money. I don't talk about money much. 
uh, except the missions. I'll, I'll raise money for missions. But uh, I appreciate your giving and, and thankful that you're willing to be a participant in this. Amen. God bless us today. You have given us uh, income and wherewithal that we may live and enjoy life. And Lord, all you ask is that we remember to give back. Because Lord, when we give, you indeed said, I will give it unto you. And you've done that. And so Lord, we thank you. Will you touch the hearts of those that are here today and cause them to be a part of what all you're doing here at Maranatha Family Church in the way of missions and the growing of our church and all the other things that come by it. Be a blessing to us as you called to do so by your word. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Marinette, the family and guests. Thank you so much for joining us today for worship. We have some events coming up, so pull out your church center app or your calendar, and let's see what's happening. Attention all connection class teachers and substitutes. Next week, immediately following the second morning service, we will be having a mandatory training meeting. Please make plans to join us and bring some food to share. If you have any questions, see Pastor Bruce. Hey, Synergy Youth, 6th to 12th grade students. This Wednesday, we are having a luau, and it's invite night. So make sure you bring a friend. Come on out at 630 to hang out with us and have a great service. See you there. To stay up to date on what's happening at Maranatha, you can check out our website, follow us on social media, or easiest of all, you can download our Church Center app. With it, you can see and register for upcoming events, give online, watch past services, and much more. Short and sweet, right? We hope you are blessed by the rest of the service. And again, thanks for choosing to worship with us today. Oh, I love that clapping. That sounds good. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover, but the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven, yeah. I believe in signs and wonders, I have resurrection power. in heaven Yeah, my praise belongs to you forever This is my testimony from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony This is my testimony Together, sons and daughters, that's all of us now, walk with blood and washed in water, sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father, cause our God will finish what He started, yes our God will finish what He started. some of y'all's also. Come on, let's keep them hands clapping, y'all. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Lord, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Oh, no. Greater things are still to come. Lord, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. I believe. Not dead, you're not 
service last Sunday in California, and I got to tell you, I like it live. <laughs> it's fun, fun, fun. We have the best music pastor and band around. You don't know it today, but, but he's been suffering uh, with a, a sinus, kind of a sinus infection thing. That's the worst thing a pastor and music people can do because it'll kill you and uh, boy they got through this big time two services I just appreciate them so much and I appreciate you guys and if you're visiting with us today hey we're so glad to have you uh, I tell people we're going to treat you so many ways you're bound to like one of them and come back and be with us yeah. we'd love to have you a few Sundays ago, I had to miss Sunday, last Sunday, but a few Sundays ago, we started a new series called Living in Babylon. What does that mean? Well, it's kind of connected to all what we've been going through for the last year or so, and uh, about what we live through in an everyday life, living in a mm, somewhat Christless world, I guess, I should say. The second sermon in this series is simply called Keeping Your Mind out of the gutter when you live in a sewer. We're going to be looking at verses 6 through 21 on uh, chapter number 1, and so we'll talk about that as we go. This is kind of an introductory, if you will, to this summer, some sermon, simply because it's long. Not going to finish it today. Probably we'll finish it next Sunday, hopefully. That's just to tell you, it's a long sermon. When I was uh, a young boy, we moved up to, to Rinkin. We moved into Westwood Heights. We were the only family there, first, church, first house, first family. And as a couple of years went by, the community grew. The Westwood Heights subdivision grew pretty, uh, pretty good. And so they didn't have city garbage pickup or anything like that so an old man had a green pickup Chevrolet truck and he would come out there and pick people's garbage up well I wanted a job and you're 12 years old you you know you want money so he said okay I'll give you two dollars a Saturday to help me I'd make a big money so he'd come pick me up, and on Saturdays, he'd, he'd pick me up, and we'd go through the community there and other communities there about, and we'd pick up garbage. It wasn't these plastic cans that have a lift, and you can pick up. This was old metal garbage cans and rubber garbage cans that you'd pick up by hand and put them in the back of his truck. And once that was done, uh, at least twice during that Saturday, we'd go to the dump. The dump was behind Westwood at that time. Uh, they have beautiful homes there now, but I got to tell you, it's built on a bunch of stinky stuff. And so uh, we would go there, and the only way to get it out was to take kind of a hoe or a yard rake, and you had to climb up in the back of that stinky truck, and you had to just rake it, rake it, rake it out, rake it onto the ground, and then go and uh, finish the task. Now, the only problem with that is by the time I got home, my mama was like, Hope, stay out in the yard. Take off your clothes, come in the house, take a shower, because you cannot deal with garbage and not get the smell on you. That's just the way it is. Well, likewise, it is a rare person who can live and work 
in a moral sewer without being personally contaminated. Character pollution is probably one of the perils of living in a contaminated culture, even for Christians. When George Gallup Jr. surveyed and compared the behavior of Christians and non-Christians, he discovered some, in my opinion, alarming trends. Let me tell you. Most Americans who profess Christianity, he said, don't act significantly different in their lives than non-Christians. He said, in other words, those who attend church are just as likely as the unchurch to engage in unethical behavior. Boy, that's a, that's a damning response to us. Increasingly, he said, the only difference between Christians and non-Christians is where they spend Sunday morning. And even that distinction is blurred as a growing percentage of Americans say they can sustain their faith by watching it online. Now, I told you I watched it last Sunday. Now, I enjoyed it, but it's not like being in person. I don't care. It's just not like being here rubbing shoulders with other Christians. And that's a little bit of what has happened to us in the past year or so. Now, on the other hand, many Christians have opted out of meaningful contact with our decaying culture, isolating themselves instead of striving to be that kind of fragrant aroma of Christ to the world. And so that's detrimental as well. You know the type. The type is like that all their friends are Christians, they fill every moment uh, of time uh, spent in fellowship and Bible study with other Christians. They look for a home that's surrounded by Christians. They want to work for Christian employers or they want to employ only Christians. And so the only contact with a non-Christian world is the brief encounter between uh, as they dart from one Christian program or activity to another. And this kind of attitude is deadly to the cause of Christ because it's the murder of evangelism. So here's the dilemma. And, and we're talking about, so that you know, if you weren't here a few Sundays ago, we're going through the book of Daniel, and we're talking about how Daniel was 14 years old. He was scooped up as the uh, uh, Babylonian king and, and those that came in destroyed and, and took over and ushered them 800 miles across the hot Mesopotamian sun and took them to Babylon and to a different culture and a different world. And so what, what I'm saying to you today is, is that it's hard, as hard as it is for Christians to stay in their Christian environment is detrimental because we lose contact with sharing the gospel with other people. A few months ago, I became increasingly aware of this, and I asked God to help me. I said, when I go around people, when I fly, when I go from different areas, have people sit by me that are non-Christian. I want to sit by them. I want to talk to them. I want to share with them. And I'll lead that, that conversation back to something that God has done. I will make a way to get that conversation around Christianity and the walk that I have with God. Now, this can be difficult. If you follow what Christ left us and it, as an example we have no choice but to engage culture and to penetrate society. Now, that's our calling. That's what God has called us to do. Be a light in a darkened world. Be salt in an unsalted world. In doing so, we're called to mix with unbelievers, to fraternize with sinners, to be alongside, not to be aloof from them, but to be alongside. And, and if you study the Gospels, even, an, even a casual study of the Gospels, 
reveals that Jesus went out of his way to cultivate relationships with worldly, sinful people. Whether it's a woman at the well, whether it's a tax collector, no matter who it was, he went out of his way to cultivate a, a relationship with these people in order to share the gospel with them. And so that's our, that's our uh, roadmap, if you will. I, I'm sure that they ruined his reputation with the religious right, but it never ruined his character. Now, here's what I believed. He walked the careful line between contact and contamination. That's our job, and that's our call today, to be able to walk that fine line between, between contact and contamination. It's hard. This line is probably one of the most difficult lines that God calls us to do. And more, listen to me, more than a few Christians have been pulled into the current of culture and have found themselves swept downstream before they were able to ever get a oar in the water. Listen to me. And I want you to hear this very well. A person, a Christian cannot successfully swim in the sinful cultural current without developing strong spiritual muscles. I want to say that one more time. A person cannot successfully swim in a sinful culture, a cultural current, without developing strong spiritual muscles. Is it Important. Oh, yeah. You try to dive in there, you don't have great spiritual muscles, you're going to drown. You're going to be caught up in that current, swept downstream. So listen to me. When we're talking about Daniel, Daniel, in my opinion, had strong spiritual muscles. And he is thrown into the Babylonian current. We talked about it last uh, a few weeks ago. He was 14 years old, had everything going for him, and he, along with uh, many of the other uh, Israelites, are, are captured Hebrews and taken 800 miles and put into the current of the Babylonian Empire. Now, you might not think much about that, but as he goes in, he encounters scores of challenges to his faith, and he faced opportunities that would cause him to compromise his commitment. Some of these were substantial, some were overt, some were calculated to subvert his faith, some, some were just seemingly innocent. And as you study this young man's life, it's interesting to see this. Although he is submerged in this pagan society, Daniel was able to to spiritually prosper. You know the end of the story, so I don't have to really tell you, but he learned to prosper in a less prosperous spiritual society. Although he's in there, he's, he's doing well. And unlike many American Christians who have retreated in the cloistered walls of Christian fellowship, Daniel didn't have a choice. He had to be fully engaged in the culture of his day, a culture that was hostile to uh, godliness. But despite all of that, he emitted this fragrant aroma of godliness into that culture. Now, I, I said this story's long, but there's three questions right at the beginning, three things. I call them tests. Three tests that we need to understand. And I think these tests were designed to destroy the faith of Daniel, but Daniel refused to compromise. So look at them with me. The first one is this, the test of fortitude. When this company of young Hebrews, hostages, arrived from Jerusalem, 
they immediately are faced with their first challenge. You may think it's nothing. All of a sudden, you go from being a Jewish young Hebrew to being a Babylonian. It would be like taking us and sitting us down in the middle of Russia and say, okay, nothing more American, you are Russian. Or being placed in, in uh, Africa, in the middle of the desert, in a cultural cri- uh, uh, tribe and saying, that's it, you're no more American, you're a part of this tribe. Can you imagine the culture shock? Can you imagine the shock to your system? And so these boys, 14, 15 years old, are brought in and they are now Babylonians. The Hebrew life is over. It's done. And so to indicate this new authority and lifestyle, these Babylonians decided to change their names from Hebrew names to Babylonian names. And what appears to be an innocent change was a very substantial attack on their identity as God's children. I want to show you their names. For Daniel, which meant God is my judge, it was changed to Belteshazzar, which meant Baal's prince. That's one of the Babylonian gods. Hananiah, which means Yahweh or God is gracious, was changed to Shadrach, meaning command of Akku, another one of their gods. Mishael, which means who is like God, was changed to Meshach, meaning who is like Akku, A-K-U, their God. And Azariah, which means God has helped or Yahweh has helped, was changed to Abednego. It meant servant of Nebo. So their Hebrew names, which connected them with God, all of a sudden were replaced with names that extolled the three Hebrew gods or three gods of the Babylonian pantheon. So Baal and Nebo and Akku was to remind them, those new names, that that's who they served, or at least that's who they thought. So they belong now not to the Hebrew God of the defeated, but to the Babylonian gods of the victorious winners. Now, think about that. Like a, like a constant dripping of water Every time they heard their new names called, these young Jews were reminded of their new identity. They didn't have time to win. Every time Daniel's called Belshazzar, he's, he's kind of grimacing because now they're saying, you belong to us. They were expected to live with Babylonian customs, to follow Babylonian law, to accept Babylonian philosophy and worship Babylonian gods. Can I tell you, that's almost uh, more than one person can, can deal with that kind of change. You're going from being a Hebrew and serving the God of the world to becoming a Babylonian, and now your call, your name has been changed to reflect that. So I asked myself the question, important question, how did they respond? How did they respond? How did they respond to this particular test? Well, very simply, they endured it. Now, that's interesting to me. It's the only thing sometimes that we can do when when a person maybe has called us a demeaning or devaluing name. Whether somebody is devaluing your character or hurling racial slurs or asserting tyrannical authority, the greatest challenge is not to stop that person, but rather stop your mind from mutilating your own identity. 
Now, what I found out when, when looking through this book, and I hope you'll take time to read the book of Daniel. Um, most people look for the, for the uh, uh, futuristic events, but, but there's some great stories here. In reading this book and studying, it's interesting to me that we never find Daniel campaigning to restore his God-honored name. You don't see him holding up a sign saying, this is not right. I have my rights. You have to call me Daniel. He doesn't do that. You don't see him raising Cain and protesting in the streets because, frankly, you can get away with that today, but there they cut your head off. So, you know, probably a good thing he didn't do that. But what is interesting to me is that he accepted the fact that his Babylonian name would be called Belshazzar. You say, what's the big deal? You know, in the whole book of Daniel, he never refers to himself by this Babylonian name. Never. Nowhere, to my knowledge, anywhere in the book of Daniel, does he refer to himself. Although he lived in Babylon... Over 70 years, Daniel never thought of himself as a Babylonian. Until the end of his life, he refused to forget that he was Daniel and God was his judge. Let me tell you something, church. We may be in this world, but we are not of this world. We may live in this culture, and people may call us names, but the fact is we're still God's sons and daughters. And the fact of it is, as long as we live here, we may have to accept that fact, but we know there's a better and more prosperous day coming. It's interesting to me that we never hear these boys trying to stop that name calling and go back. They just accepted it. What are you saying, Pastor? We may not ever be able to fully change the culture of this world but we cannot allow it to contaminate who we are and if we're going to swim in this culture we have to develop strong spiritual muscles test number two i call it the test of truth not only did daniel and his friends have to endure this uh name change, this subtle sort of brainwashing of Babylon names, but now they were to be thoroughly indoctrinated in the Babylonian thinking by studying under, under the most learned scholars of Babylon for three years. The king said, I want you to take those who are the best physical specimens, mental specimens, the best looking guys. I want you to put them into my service. We're going to change their names, and we're going to teach them all about Babylon and the history and the culture and everything. So Daniel and them have to do that. So their uh, education, all his design was calculated to change the way that they would see the world and to make them think like Babylonians thought. It was also designed to replace their biblical perspective with a pagan worldview. That tactic is still used today in, in TV ads and schools and other things. Watch television commercials, and you'll quickly see they're trying to change the way you think. They want you to think like they think. And so they do anything and everything to do that. But don't think it just stops with television ads. Can I tell you they're trying to do it with your children? That's why in, in grammar school, in early education, in first grade, second grade, kindergarten, kids are taught, you don't have to choose to be a girl or a boy right now. Choose what you want to be. If, you're a, if you think you're a boy but you want to be a girl, you just choose to be one. And they teach them that, and they subvert them that way. Let me tell you something. Catholics said a number of years ago, give us your children through age six, and they'll always be a Catholic. 
I'm telling you that the world is saying, give us your children and we'll change them. We'll make them be what we want them to be. We're living in a terrible, ungodly culture that is trying to change even our youngest children to subvert them to get away from Christianity. You say, oh, come on, preacher. Are you sure? I'm glad you asked me. This just come across the airways. It's been posted on Facebook and other places. It's from the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus. Here's their song. We're coming for your children. We're coming for them. Your children will care about fairness and justice for others. Your children will work to convert all your sisters and brothers. Then soon we'll, we're almost certain your kids will start converting you. The gay agenda is coming. The gay agenda is here. That's across your airways. That's being posted all over, all over the kinds of social media that's out there. They're trying to change them. Let me tell you something. Can I tell you something as a pastor today? And I've been a pastor for nearly 47 years, and I'm here to tell you, if you don't have your children in, in, in Sunday school or connection classes, you need to get them there. Because what they learn as children will definitely change how they grow up as adults. And I, I'm tell you, I'm embarrassed at a culture that calls themselves Christians, and when Jeopardy puts on a Bible category, they don't know a thimble full of information. They don't know the simplest of Bible stories that we've been taught all of our lives in Sunday school. I'm telling you, this man's grandmother taught me when I was was a little boy in Sunday school that, that directed the challenge of my life. Sure, I was a non-Christian, but I never lost those values. Why? Because they were ingrained in me, and they, the world, know that. And if they can change our children, if they can change them as children, they can change them as adults. Church, we need to wake up. Wake up. Get in a Bible study program. Get in a place of learning. Let me tell you, if if, if, you, if you don't want to bring them to Sunday school, then it's your responsibility to get in home and open up that scripture and turn off the television and train those children up in a way that they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from it. It's your responsibility. We wonder what's wrong with them when they get older. It's because we haven't taught them when they were younger, I'm putting this responsibility square on your shoulders today. If you have children and grandchildren, it's your responsibility to teach those children the ways of God. You say, Pastor, where do you get all that? I'm looking at three, four guys, at least, that we know of, that were taken out of a Hebrew culture who had been trained, taught, and live the, Bab the, the Hebrew lifestyle. And now they are placed in a Babylonian culture. They are living in Babylon. And now they're being forced to change their names. Now they're being placed in their, their schools. They have to learn six different languages. They have to learn astronomy. They have to learn agriculture they have to learn astrology they have to learn the architectural stuff the math the natural science and and literature literature being the most difficult attack on their faith and confidence in god the babylonians had their own uh, accounts of of biblical events the una elisha was a replacement of what we taught our Noah's creation. The Andapan was a Babylonian version of the fall of man. The Gilgamesh epoch was a story of the flood. All of this literature, all of it, was not only to extol the Babylonian gods, but portrayed a, a very pagan view of life 
and ethics. In other words, they wanted to say, they wanted to say to, to uh, those boys, your defeated God of the Hebrews is nothing. Here's how it really, here's how it really happens. And so they made out like all of our stuff was false. You see how important it is for our children to know the very simplest of facts in Bible stories. They need to hear it over and over again. When, when Abraham was older, it, it was said that he would gather his children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren around him, and at night, they'd play on their phones. <laughs> oh, well, maybe not. At night, he would recount the stories of a God who was greater than anything else. And they grew up learning that. So Daniel and his fellow men were going to be placed in this service, placed in this learning, changed their names, placed them in this educational system, if you will, all to subvert their faith. And then after three years, they figured they could change them all together, take them and place them because they were the brightest of all the stars. They were the, they were the brightest of all those young men coming out of Babylon. So we can bring them into the cultural uh, ways of Babylon, let them work for the king. Question again. How did the young Jewish students then respond to this attempted indoctrination? You're going to be surprised. They applied themselves and mastered the curriculum. I can't believe that. Why didn't they protest? Because they could get their heads cut off. Why didn't they stop it? Because they couldn't. So what did they do? They applied themselves and did good made the best grades, passed all the tests, and they survived. Now, you say, is that important? There again, they were so grounded in their faith, 14 years in the Hebrew culture, they were so grounded in their faith and truth of Scripture, they... All of the falsehoods that now were going to be taught to them never mastered them. Yes. Never mastered them. As immersed in the culture as they were, Daniel and his friends never forgot, never let the culture penetrate them. They never forgot who they were or who they belonged to. What are you saying, Pastor? We. We can't get out of this world. We can't build a community of isolation and say, now don't go outside these walls. There's, there's bad stuff out there. Lions and tigers and bears, oh my! <laughs> but we have to penetrate this culture. Not only is it God's request that we do, it is the right thing to do. There's people out there going to hell. They need a light. There are people out there losing their, their lives. They need our help. There are people out there struggling that need our help. And so while we can't get away from this culture, we don't have to let the culture penetrate us. Last test. The test of fidelity. I've talked a lot about how they let them change their names. They let them teach them all of their ways, but never letting them penetrate themselves. But at best, in this culture we live in, there will come times when we have to say, nope, not going there. Although Daniel endured his name change, and he participated in the educational system, there are some things that his conscience, his teaching, 
would simply not allow him to tolerate. And one of those was the eating of food offered by the king. Now, some people might say, no big deal. Eat the food. Who cares? But Daniel knew that this was not the problem of the lavishness of the food because the king had the best, right? It, it, it even is not the strength of the drink, nor was it the picky eating habits of a teenager, and we know they have them. The issue, and this is important, was fidelity with God. All the meat and the wine that came from the king's household was first offered sacrificially to the Babylonian gods. And Daniel says, nope, can't go there. Now, according to God's law, for Daniel to partake of, of this would be to participate in idolatry. And so, since Daniel was a, an astute young man, and he knew that Jewish idolatry was precisely the reason they were in Babylon now, he wasn't going to blur. He wasn't going to blur the line between right and wrong that had been made clear in the law. You ever notice how people that want to subvert God's law try to find little gimmicks and glitches? Well, you know, it really doesn't mean that. Uh, uh, you know, I actually can do this, but, you know, when you start doing that, you start subverting and blurring the lines between right and wrong. We make up a lot of stuff, both good and bad. The idea is to follow God's law. So, he knew that he just couldn't say no. The king's servant comes in to, to Daniel, and he said, hey, man, the uh, king wants you to eat all this stuff because it's going to really make you guys blossom and be strong and whatever. And Daniel knew to say, nope, not going to happen, not going to do it, just forget it. So the king's servant then goes back to the king and said, I'm sorry, these old boys don't want to do it. And so he says, okay, throw them in the fiery pit. No, no big deal. Just kill them. So Daniel knew to survive, he had to figure out a way in which he could not go that direction and still not wind up in the fiery furnace or the lion's den which he did both. So, I learned that this matter of refusing the king and his fare was a touchy situation. It was so important that Daniel handle it carefully. Church, this is an awesome story. If, if you read either Daniel or you go back and read the story of Joseph, the way that they handled a situation meant the difference in, in being untrue to God and staying alive. And it's important that we learn that in our society, as we're swimming in the sewer, a, a, a moral sewer, we have to learn to negotiate that in such a way that we don't become contaminated with the world and yet stay true to God. And so when I begin to study all of it, I handle it, I handle it so well, the strategy that Daniel used is incredible. The things that he did, the choices he's made, the way he structured it, is an absolute marvel of leadership and surviving the sewer. The only problem is you're going to have to wait till next week. <laughs> it's too long for me to go into it. I'll give you the first one. Make up your mind ahead of time. 
you have to figure this thing out. The world is after us, church. I don't mean that in the way of trying to kill us or anything, but they might like to, but <laughs> the worst thing is they're trying to destroy our lives. They're trying to take our children. The culture of this world is anti-God. And what we have to do is figure out the way to live in this world, be a light in this world, and yet stay apart from this world. We're here for a few years, but guess what? One of these days we get to graduate to heaven. We'll talk about that later. But next Sunday, we're going to continue this service. I, I couldn't get it all in one. It's like 25 pages of notes. So <laughs> I couldn't get it all. Unless you want to stay here for like till tonight about 7 or 8 o'clock, we can probably get through it. Maybe you're here today and you're living in a Babylonian culture. And you need to get out of it. Maybe it's dragging you down. Maybe it's pulling you aloof from Christ. Today you'd like to make that transition. God's got you back on this thing. He'd like to help you. Maybe you're here and you just say, Pastor, you know, I'm, the world is influencing me more than them. I, I'll tell you a hard story. I'm, I'm so ashamed of it. I'm, I'm just totally ashamed. But I'll tell you for a fact that when I was struggling in my faith for a few years, 10 years. And while I was remaining a Christian, I was being influenced. In fact, I got a job at a place where it was just terrible. And instead of me influencing them, I, I allowed them to influence me. Bruce, my walk with God was was slow at that time. I, I, I com comment on Brother Bruce. He has strong spiritual habits of study and, and uh, discipline, and he's teaching some of the others that. But I have to tell you, at that time, I was struggling. And it was easy to let the culture of that world take me in. And I find I told Mike one day, we were going to his church, and I said, Bo, this job is killing me. Spiritually, it's killing me. You know, it wasn't long after that, and I'm, I'm not telling you God caused it. I'm just saying, I had a terrible motorcycle accident where I nearly lost my left leg. But it allowed me to get away from that culture and to get back into a place where I could concentrate on God and listen to Teresa. <laughs> she encouraged me during a time that was tough. And... Uh, it was, it was helpful for me to climb out of that moral sewer. And it's, it's easy for you to fall into that moral sewer. You, you work with people like that. You live around people like that. It's hard sometimes when the language they use and the stories they tell and the things that they do, you know is not right. But you get dragged into that culture. God says, let me tell you this joke. It's not bad. You can't use it in the pulpit, but it's not bad. I'm like, oh, don't tell it to me. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to be drug into that culture. Maybe you're living there today, and you're saying, Pastor, that's, that's what's happening to me. I'm, I'm kind of living in that culture, and I, don't, I need to know what to do. Well, you need to be here next Sunday, first of all. And second of all, you need to know that whatever you're whatever you're." Moral compass is in God. You need to stick with it. Don't let it lead you astray. And God will help you through this. Bow your heads for just a moment. Hey, Donnie, do you know that little children's song, This Little Light of Mine? All right. Maybe, maybe you're here today and, and you... By the uplifting of your hand, you might say to me, Pastor, I, I live in a kind of a moral sewer here with my job or, or our culture or whatever, and, and I don't want to live there. I want to move out. Can you pray for me? And I want to. Because I want a strong spiritual church. And so to teach you and to help you in this, I know it's not 
I'm not shouting and carrying on, but I want you to live a better life. I want you to be strong in your faith. Uh, if you need a little discipline, call, call Pastor Bruce. Set up an appointment to talk with him. He's a great person to lead you in a, in a disciplined life of Christ. And he can help you there. So maybe you're here today and you just slip up that hand. Pastor, I'm, I'm struggling in this moral sewer I've been living in. Thank you. There's already hands going up. I love that. Hands are going up. I struggle in this stupid moral sewer I'm being forced to live in. I want to teach you how to fight that, but I want to pray for you as well. So if you want to lift your hand, thank you. Are there others? Thank you. Are there others? Still, hands are going up, going up. I understand. Listen, you have a pastor who understands because I've been there. Maybe the greatest thing that I ever did, God taught me through that valley. And I'm able to share with you the strengths of it now. A number of hands have gone up. Uh, let me just say this as we, as we get ready to pray. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, let me invite you to come. It's just easy enough to come and say, Lord, I'm tired of running. I just want to make everything right today. I want to invite you to come as well. If you're struggling in that, God loves you. I'm a product of that. I'm a product of God's mercy and His grace. I remain that today. And if you want to do that, just step out from where you're at, slip up here. I'm going to pray with you if you do. Father God, you saw the hands more than I could imagine went up. That's really fighting to, to stay true in this moral sewer in which we're living in. And so, Lord, I pray for these that raise their hands. I pray that you'll strengthen them. I pray that as we go through this, this whole series that they'll learn how to live and survive and be strong even in Babylon, Lord. That's where we're living at. So we've got to learn how to make it. And I want to see them be able to do that. So I'm praying for their strength. I'm praying for wisdom. I'm praying for your touch in their hands. Lord, in this moral sewer that we live in, let us all become the light in the darkness, the salt where there is none. Lord, let us become what you want us to be, not isolated, not insulated, but free from the contamination of this world to live like you want us to live. Father God, I thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Well, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Oh, this little light, yes, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. name. I thank you so this much for your love and mercy and kindness. Today, I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.
Father, bless us as we go. Keep us in peace. Let your face shine upon us. Let your smile be to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Fellowship together.